Hello and welcome to Meon 5. I sure hope you enjoyed my two shows on the Hoke family in Rockland, Maine, true military heroes. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed doing that show. It ran a little long because of COVID and because of the inability to come to the studio. I'm now back in the studio for the first time in several months. Uh, I've got my mask, a little Batman mask sent to me by my sister-in-law. Uh, but uh, I'm here in the studio all by myself. We have the director in the next room. Uh, no camera people here uh, because we're just getting back uh, into normalcy here at Channel 5, the Portland Media Center. Today's show is a different topic, uh, but it does affect, uh, does relate to the military in some respects. I'm doing a show today about the 1918 Spanish flu and its relationship to me and the fact that I just had my second COVID shot a couple weeks ago, and my wife will have her second COVID shot today at five o'clock. In 1918, the worst pandemic in world history took place. It was called the Spanish flu, not because a politician coined that phrase, but because that seemed to be the country that was among the hardest hit. And it also, occurred, uh, they believe, because of uh, soldiers returning uh, from that World War I, uh, which also took many lives. They believe that the first outbreak of Spanish flu in 1918 took place at a place called Fort Riley, Kansas. And it took place in March of 1918, approximately 103 years ago, almost this very minute. 500 million people were affected by this flu. At least 100 million people died from this flu, more than COVID at the present time. They believe that the number of deaths in the United States alone was at least 675,000. Will COVID match that? Well, if those people down in Miami and the rest of those folks around the country wanna keep these giant events going on, then maybe we might surpass 675,000. Most of those people, 99% of the people that contracted the Spanish flu were under the age of 65, and most of them between the ages of 20, 40. Because the amazing thing about the Spanish flu was that it affected healthy people. And one of those people, one of the 100 million, was my grandfather, Ellsworth Turner Rumlet I. He died when he was 32 years old and my father was six. So this man, my grandfather, passed away literally 38, uh, 28 years before I was even born. Another fact that you might want to consider when you try to think of 100 million people, how many is that? It's just, to us it's just a number. But that would be 100 times the population of the state of Maine. It would be like the state of Maine, the entire state of Maine, passing away every single day, the entire population, for 100 days. It is the entire uh, capacity of Fenway Park, not a few thousand times, but 300,000 times. That's what it took. That's how many people passed away from the Spanish flu. The thing that occurred during the Spanish flu was similar to what happened with COVID. The only cure for it, there, was no, there were no antibiotics, antibiotics, no vaccine ever occurred uh, for the Spanish flu as we have with COVID in one year. A miraculous thing that we live in the 21st century and we can have a cure to the COVID vaccine uh, manufactured in one year. Uh, so they, all they could do was have isolation, quarantine, good hygiene, no gathering. And yet, of course, there was no television back then. Every day for the last year, you turn on the Today Show, what's the first piece of news? Every day, what's the first piece of news you see on any uh, station that you watch? It's all about COVID. And even, amazingly enough, even with all this news, people are still going to flock to Miami Beach or flock to these uh, places and have these gatherings without masks. Why? I have no clue. Um, one of the tragic things about the Spanish flu of 1918 was that 
they, they were digging mass graves with steam, steam shovels. Many times there were no coffins. Uh, women were making these white shrouds for these people to be buried in literally shallow graves because they believed that if you had a white shroud, you might get quicker to heaven. And folks, here was a very sad part. We know that over the last year, people have not been able to go to funerals. How many times have we read about the passing of, a, of, of someone? It's happened to me several times this year where I've lost a dear friend. I just lost a dear friend, John Delahanty. Uh, and and you, you can't go to the funeral because you can't have these gatherings. So there were no eulogies. There were no choirs. There, there were no uh, uh, people standing around and, and having uh, stories about their friend, about their family. Um, it was made a very lasting impression on people. And this was a very sad part of, of the Spanish flu, uh, that uh, people were passing away, and it just, it just was like a, a, like a, a common occurrence and because so many people were passing away. Um, the other thing is that the cities were worse, uh, and Portland was very hard hit. I believe a doctor told me once that at least 3,000 people passed away in the city of Portland, and my grandfather, uh, may he rest in peace, was one of them. My grandmother, Christine Weyer, uh, Runlet at the time, uh, survived. She had two children, my father, age six, and his sister, Constance Runlet, age 12. The, uh, the result of that is, is my grandmother uh, remarried uh, three times after that. I made a comment at the cemetery that uh, is going to be played later uh, that I'm not sure any of the three men that she married afterwards could quite match up to my grandfather. Uh, I'm not trying to be mean here, but I just read a note one day that he wrote about her and how much he loved her. But I also want to talk to you about the history of, of, of pandemics in, in the world and in this country. In 1890, one million passed away. In 1957, believe it or not, there was a thing called the Asian flu. In 1977, a thing called the Russian flu. And then in 2009, there was yet another flu. Uh, the ordinary flu every year, which people uh, blamed for this uh, uh, pandemic. They said, oh, many people, oh, this is just another flu. This is just, people are just passing away from the flu. Well, the, the death toll for people passing away from the ordinary flu, so-called, uh, would be somewhere between 300,000 and, say, 600,000 uh, on any uh, given year. What was also horrible about the Spanish flu was the symptoms. Uh, with COVID, we know that there are many symptoms. Uh, mostly it's the lungs and people are, have, have flu type symptoms uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, you know, l l lack of smell, lack of taste. Uh, some people are having neurological problems. Uh, they don't know the long term effects of COVID-19 yet and they discuss that almost every day. But with uh, the Spanish flu, it was, it was much worse, believe it or not. Uh, they had nose and stomach, insomnia, blurred vision. These people uh, they would develop uh, a, a, a discoloration of the face, and then suddenly their bodies would turn black. They would, it, would, it, would, it was a horrible, horrible uh, way that these poor people were passing. The only thing that they could give these, these poor folks to, to get through this was either aspirin, actually Bayer aspirin was uh, in effect back then, uh, or, or whiskey. So if you went to a hospital, they might have the, the most rudimentary of, of cures, uh, aspirin, whiskey, uh, Epsom salts, whatever. Uh, they believed that, uh, uh, that one of the possibilities of this flu was that the Germans actually started it by poisoning uh, Bayer aspirin. That was, of course, a rumor. The other thing that was uh, uh, pretty incredible about this Spanish flu was that there was not much news about it. They did not have television back then like we do every day and we have the internet and we have got, uh, you know, cell phones. Uh, they, it was the newspapers. And for some reason, well, actually, we know the reason, the newspapers did not want to cause a panic. Uh, and so they would literally sometimes censor the actual uh, data that was going on. We know that the, uh, that's, uh, some people have been accused of that in this particular country. I think the president said, well, they're taking too many tests. So... 
there was not much news about it. And the second thing is, is that in 1918, we were in the midst of World War I. So people were losing their loved ones in the war, and they were losing their loved ones through uh, the Spanish flu. And I, I recall uh, in my readings about uh, the Spanish flu uh, that many soldiers were coming home with it and bringing it home and passing it on uh, to other people. Here in the United States, uh, they are warning that those folks that are down in Miami Beach, I keep using that as the example, uh, are, are going to leave Miami Beach after they're drinking and jumping up and down and enjoying themselves and go back to their families, perhaps to elderly people, perhaps to their parents, and may very well pass the uh, COVID uh, 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 problem uh, to their own family. I consider this uh, among the most selfish uh, of all behavior. Uh, the thing about wearing masks, we know that there's a debate about that. I could not believe that a United States senator would sit on national television and debate the man who has been pretty much the spokesperson for our country, Dr. Fauci, on uh, the efficacies of wearing the mask. Why is this such a problem? Why are people having so much difficulty with that? We're not asking you to put on a suit of armor. We're not asking you uh, to, to do something difficult. And it's a matter of courtesy and respect. Uh, and I have to say that when I walked in the studio today, uh, my director, he knows uh, that I've had, had the vaccine, and we discuss whether or not, uh, as I'm sitting in this big giant studio by myself, do I have to wear a mask? Uh, and, and we decided that I did not have to. So now I want to talk about uh, my grandfather. Uh, I want to play a little clip uh, that I shot down as I stood uh, next to Jay's Oyster Bar because in my own imagination, uh, I've imagined uh, that uh, uh, my father's uh, cold storage place and his fish processing plant was down uh, on, uh, on the marina near DeMillo's. So I'm going to play this little clip for you uh, about uh, my father, uh, my grandfather. My grandfather would be some surprise to see uh, Chandler's Wharf here and all the condominiums. I think he would have been uh, quite amazed to know how much this property would be worth about 100 years later. Not just because of the restaurant, but because this is uh, one of the most famous places uh, in the uh, state of Maine. You know, there's a fairly strong possibility uh, that the, uh, my father's, my grandfather's uh, cold storage place might have been right here where Portland's most famous restaurant is, DeMillo's or at least along this part of the waterfront. He also had a fish market on Commercial Street, which is, of course, right adjacent to the DeMillo's uh, parking lot. So if, in fact, my grandfather's coal storage place was right here where DeMillo's place is, then I guess, uh, I guess I should be pretty proud of that. The other thing I want to mention uh, is that uh, my grandfather had a business uh, that at one time was called Verrill and Runlet, and we're going to put the slide up there that was sent to me by one of my best friends, Don Drew. And he found this picture somewhere. And it's Verrill and Runlet. And the reason why that is of, of great significance to me is because my grandmother used the law firm of Verrill and Dana, which is now simply called Verrill. I have many dear friends at Verrill, Peter Webster, the uh, former senior partner, Roger Putnam, uh, Bob Patterson, I can uh, name, name after names of the fondness I have for Verrill and Dana, which actually uh, also happened to be my law firm when I was in college. I had a, a trust fund administered uh, by Verrill and Dana. So uh, I, I like to think that my father would have been associated uh, with a very prominent Verrill uh, and that uh, uh, what would have happened if my grandfather had remained alive uh, and I had gone to Bowdoin College and the University of Maine School of Law, uh, might I have ever uh, possibly joined the law firm of Verrill and Dana? Uh, well, uh, they still became uh, very good friends. So uh, my grandfather had uh, a coal storage place and I once saw a, a, a giant mural. It must have gone, I don't know, 15 feet or so in uh, a friend's house. And in that mural were two giant buildings, both of which said Runlet Coal Storage. 
it's the only name you can see in the entire uh, mural. This thing goes, uh, like I said, about 15 feet across this wall. Uh, and that would have been uh, my grandfather, who also, by the way, uh, invented a uh, fish scaling machine. Uh, and we're going to show you that picture. Uh, I had that uh, patent uh, framed uh, and gave that to my daughter for her graduation uh, in engineering from uh, Mississippi State. Uh, I think my grandfather at age 32 was well on his way to success on Commercial Street in the city of Portland uh, when he was uh, taken uh, from us at a very early age along with uh, approximately 3,000 other people in the city of Portland. So what happened after that? Well, uh, my grandmother who lived uh, on West Street, 56 West Street at the time, remarried a couple of times. Uh, my father, uh, bless him, uh, graduated from Portland High School and went to Bowdoin College and graduated with a class of 1933. I recall at my own graduation uh, in 1968, 35 years later, as the procession came through uh, the gymnasium, uh, our class was all lined up and a wonderful man by the name of uh, Charlie Boyd uh, stopped the entire class of 33 so that they could meet me. Uh, and that was one of the great uh, moments uh, of my graduation and uh, perhaps the greatest moment of my graduation from Bowdoin College to meet the, uh, these wonderful men that were with my father. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Boyd actually asked me to join his insurance company. He had a very successful insurance company here in Maine. And his son was the fraternity brother, uh, Bobby Boyd, uh, who, uh, who gave me my pin to join Zeta Psi. He passed away tragically in the Vietnam War as a uh, first lieutenant. Uh, I attended his uh, funeral uh, when I was a senior at Bowdoin College. So that is pretty much the history of my grandfather. So what I move to now, however, I move to COVID-19 in the year 2020, 2021. It is amazing to me because I will share with this audience, and this is why I call this a main story for me on five, main on five, is because I wondered to myself, what are the chances that a grandfather and a grandson would pass away uh, in the same kind of pandemic? And it bothered me for the entire year because I thought to myself, I, would, I do not want to be part of that ironic uh, story. So when they came down with a COVID vaccine, I went over to Martin's Point, we'll go back over there again today, and I will have uh, my, uh, my wife will have her a second shot. I can't begin to tell you how impressed I am with Martin, Martin's Point and the way they've dealt with it and the way Maine Health has dealt with it out at Scarborough Downs. Uh, it is just such a pleasure to see people in such a professional atmosphere. You show up at a certain time, they bring you in. But there's only one <laughs> comment I have to make that's strange to me. Uh, I am a member of Martin's Point. I have a Martin's uh, Point Generations card. And yet they want you to bring your Medicare card with you. So for those of you that are going to get your shot, uh, most of the people are going to want, uh, most of the facilities are going to want your Medicare card. And my response to them was, I haven't used that card in 10 years. I don't know where it is. I don't know where my wife's is. Uh, and I find it hard to believe that a man 90 years old uh, would still have a card that was sent to him 25 years ago when he turned 65. Uh, so it, I will tell you that if you have not yet had the COVID shot, uh, you have to be uh, uh, cognizant that you might have to bring a card for you. Uh, if you're under 65, it won't be a Medicare card. You'll be bringing your insurance card. And uh, they want you to show up at a certain time. They want you to wear your mask. They want you to distance. And of course, they do not want you showing up with any symptoms. They will ask you several times, have you had the symptoms? Have you been with anybody with the symptoms? And you know something, folks? I don't get tired of being asked that question. I had a haircut before I came over here. Uh, and uh, the people at, the, at my uh, hair salon, uh, uh, Hair Unlimited, asked me uh, those very questions. And I don't resent being asked those questions. I had some dental work done the other day, and the same thing happened. Uh, by the way, I'm not allowed to, 
give commercials or endorsements for people, but I do want to give a shout out to Dr. Oates and, and Megan Terrian, who did a wonderful job on this new four unit bridge that I have uh, uh, in, in, uh, in my mouth at this present time. So I give great thanks uh, uh, to my uh, grandfather. And now I'm going to show the clip uh, at the Portland Cemetery where I'm at my grandfather's grave and then at the grave of my father uh, and of uh, my grandmother, uh, who, God bless her, was smart enough to fall in love with a man by the name of Ellsworth Turner Rumlet. And we'll show those clips now. So the reason why Ellsworth Rumlet didn't really pass away completely in 1918 of the Spanish flu is because of the legacy that he left. First of all, he left a wonderful wife, Christine Wyatt Jones, because she married uh, three other times after that. I don't think any of those people could actually match my grandfather. And then they had two children before he passed away. My father, Ellsworth Rummett II, who passed away in 1958 at the age of 46. He also had a daughter, Constance Rundlet, who went to, ended up in Santa Barbara, and she had uh, a family, including one Colonel Charles Chuck Clark, a decorated war veteran from Vietnam and a true hero of a person, my first cousin. He passed away just this past year, not because of COVID, but because of other causes. And his wonderful widow, uh, Elizabeth Clark, lives in St. Louis Obispo as I speak. But there was one other person, Constance Rumlin. My father's sister got married to Lieutenant Otto Wilbur Anderson, who died tragically when his plane went off an aircraft carrier in 1930. He lived from 1904 to 1930, and for some reason, is buried in this cemetery alongside uh, his brother-in-law and of course uh, his mother-in-law. So because of Ellsworth Rumlet's success, he left a legacy including my father going to Bowdoin College and I went to Bowdoin College thanks to a trust fund left to me by my grandmother. So I give thanks to her and I give thanks to him for the legacy I thank him for his name, and I also have a grandson, Ellsworth Turner Rumlet V. To all those people, including my brother, George W. Rumlet, who is buried right here beside his father, and my mother, who is buried here. So these are my family, and I thank Ellsworth Rumlet. I hate the Spanish flu, and I hate this COVID thing, but I'm so glad that I have his legacy. So, uh, I want to thank you for joining me on this very important show one year uh, after the COVID vaccine uh, pandemic, uh, excuse me, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic began. It's one year later, this country is hopefully getting back to normal. And I look forward to seeing my friends, my family, and you folks out there on the street, in restaurants, in theaters, at uh, the Sea Dogs game. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the, the people in this country, the health care workers, you f unbelievable folks, the folks who work in the grocery stores, all of you folks that are driving the buses, the police, the firefighters, all of you folks who have risked your lives, literally risking your lives to take care of all of us in this most difficult year of my life and I'm going to assume your lives. So thank you to the state of Maine and thank you, I look forward to seeing all you folks, and next month on Me on Five.